So Professor Brewer, what do you typically do on your weekends? On weekends, I'd sit on my couch and I'd watch television all weekend long. If I'm really motivated, I'll get up out of the chair and play a DVD rather than look at the hundreds of cable channels that are available to me. But normally I can find something on a cable channel that's watchable, so I save a little wear and tear on my DVD players. So uh, I don't have a very exciting weekend. So uh, normally on the weekend I'm at my house doing nothing but uh, laundry and uh, watching television. So what kind of shows do you watch? What do you watch on the DVDs? What kind of movies do you like? Well, I like all kinds of movies and stuff. I listen to a lot of classical music, particularly opera. Well, that's not available on the cable, so I have to I spend a lot of time listening to XM radio, which is what you hear in the background. This is XM's opera channel, and so uh, that's an amusing diversion. I like all kinds of movies, histories, westerns, etc. I even watch professional wrestling at, uh, late on Saturday night, not because I think the matches are real, but because it's really funny and well written. And uh, it, I go as amazed that people will sit there and get excited about something that they know is totally bogus. Uh, Professor, have you ever been involved with playing music or singing? Like you no, like I have no talent whatsoever. I can't sing anything. I remember once I was in a uh, church, trying out for a church choir. A guy pulled me aside and he uh, conducted some tests on me. Decided I wasn't tone deaf, I simply had no singing voice. So um, I'm a strictly a listener and not a performer. How old are you? I'm 70 years old. There is only one good thing about turning 70 in the state of Georgia. You're exempt from jury duty. That's it. There are, there are no other advantages. Um, so I got the little uh, form in my mail saying I was summoned for jury duty. I just mailed them back and said I'm 70. They sent me a letter saying that I was exempted from jury duty unless the situation which caused my exemption was no longer valid. And since I don't expect to get any younger, I'm, go I'm gone forever from the courthouse. Another thing from your emails, so I've always seen this kitty cat signature. What is the origin of that? How I stole you... it from someone on the internet. I mean, someone spent a lot of time creating that signature. So I just did a control A, control C, and control V. And, uh, yeah. Just the way I do a lot of stuff. Fortunately, you can't copyright something that simple, so I don't have to worry about being uh, prosecuted by whoever devised it the first time. So, over your 70 years, where have you lived? What parts of the world have you lived in, or just states in the United States? I've only lived in three states in the United States, Tennessee, Texas, and Georgia. The biggest difference between them is neither Tennessee nor Texas have a state income tax. Georgia does have a state income tax. It, by paying the money doesn't bother me because I realize the government is going to get the money. It's trying to figure the form out. For many years, I couldn't figure it out why they made a form that was so difficult to follow. Then it occurred to me that a state legislature undoubtedly had relatives whose job it was preparing tax forms. So therefore, by making a state income tax form, which is almost incomprehensible to follow, it generated income for all of their relations who had jobs in tax preparation services. I will never forget the first time I filled out a state of Georgia income tax return. At the bottom it said, have you paid your intangible tax? If not, why not? There was nothing in the form that explained what an intangible tax was. So I sat down and wrote them a letter that all, I, I didn't have any intangibles because I didn't own any ghost. That's like what I consider to be intangible. And therefore I decided since I don't know what an intangible is, and you won't tell me, I can't possibly owe a tax on it. That brings us to the next part about your interest in academia and electrical engineering. So, when did you decide, or was it just like a moment or a period of time over which you decided that you liked electrical engineering? When I was in high school, the thing that interested me most was astronomy. But I found out in order to get a job in astronomy, you had to have a PhD. Then I also found out that observatories are really cold in the middle of the night. 
So I looked for something that was more profitable with only a BS degree and in fact offered better working conditions than being in an observatory on the top of a mountain in the middle of winter. Electrical engineering was exciting to me. Mechanical engineering, I mean, um, involved things of removing like lathes and stuff like that. Civil engineering involved a lot of standing out in the woods with sextants at that time. We didn't have GPS systems back when I was an undergraduate, so they just wandered out in the woods and played around with sextants and all kinds of other stuff. But electrical engineering, you got to stay inside most of the time, and you got to use a lot of equations, and I've always enjoyed using equations. I decided not to major in math or physics because unless you have a PhD, the only thing you can do is teach high school. I don't know what high schools are like now, but back then, high school students were not known for respecting their teachers and usually thought of really diminutive nicknames for them, and I decided I couldn't take it. So I went into electrical engineering. As a professor, what is a typical day like? Well, I get here and I uh, I have certain courses to teach. This summer I have 3043 and 4043. Uh, 3043s are a required course. It has about 50 students this summer. 4043 is an elective course. It has around 10 students. And so uh, my main concern is that we have the best possible equipment we can get with the funds that are available for the students taking this course. And it's equipment of the type that will be useful to them in their career. And they're doing experiments which will be of use to them someday. When I was a student, well, the first thing we did as freshmen was we had experiments in chemistry. We did things like the hydrolysis of water. I know that water is H2O. It's nev never been of any benefit to me to know that. And if I were to repeat the hydrolysis of water experiment, it would mean nothing to me today. However, going into an EE lab, building a circuit on a breadboard and making measurements with the oscilloscopes, function generators, and digital multimeters is interesting to me because I want to see how close the, what I get in the lab compares with the computer simulations and what the theoretical equations state. So that's always been of interest to me. What if I had my life to live over again, I think I would go to Georgia Tech and major in computer engineering because although I use computers continuously and constantly, I really have no idea how one works. I know if you type on a keyboard or move a mouse, something happens on the screen, and I tell it to find the roots of an equation, it finds the roots of an equation. So I understand NAND gates, door gates, and stuff like that. I could even take a crack at a field, a field programmable gate array or something like that, or maybe even a microprocessor. But a general purpose computer, I have no idea how Bill Gates figured all this stuff out. And so if I were to come back, I would try to become a uh, computer engineer so that I could simply figure out how a computer works. And this bothers me. I don't know how my car works, but I have less interest in that. I get in my car, I push a button, the engine comes on. I grab certain controls, it goes forward, it goes backwards. But this is a relatively little interest to me. But I've always had a curiosity as you plug a computer into an AC wall out of it, you type certain things on it and magic things happen. And I sort of like to know how the magic works. So you said you were interested in equations and in, that's how you got into electrical engineering yes. in your high school years and during your college. And so eventually, how did you decide between going into the industry versus you know becoming a professor? How did that come about? Well, in the industry, you work very fixed hours, like 8 o'clock to 5. I like to get here when I get here and leave when I want to leave. You can do that in academia. Of course, you have to be here when you have scheduled classes. But for the most part, you can pick out the times you want to work. So today, normally I get here around noon, and I leave at about 9 or 9.30 at night. This means that I don't drive and rush hour traffic, and also that's simply when the labs that I teach are normally offered. And so I want to be here when the labs are being taught, so I can help, if I can help, with any problems the students might have. So over your academic career, have you been taking sabbaticals? And if you have been No, I need a job. I don't take time off. I mean, I'm here constantly. Um, if I were to take time off, the people employing me could figure out they could survive without me. 
and I would come back and find that they've changed the locks on my door. I wanted to ask some questions about 3043 in particular, especially the final review slides that you had for the spring semester, yeah. the comics. What, what is the source of those comics? Those comics are primarily from the Agilent uh, website. Agilent is a company which is undergoing changes. It's originally founded back in the 1950s, or maybe even 40s, by two guys named Hewlett and Packard, and they decided to change their name of the Test and Measure Division. Agilent Technologies, now it's being changed to Keysight Technologies. And they always had a lot of uh, interest in education and they had these various cartoons which you can find by simply googling Agilent, uh, Agilent Academic Cartoons or something like that. They're, they're nothing that belongs to me in particular. Occasionally I'll see something on the web that I like and grab it. I've always been amused by the people who publish the textbooks for my course. They're very concerned when I use any kind of picture or something, I have to get full permission from whoever took the picture because they're worried about being sued. I don't care. I mean, if, if people sued somebody every time they saw a picture that's taken from some other website, I mean, there couldn't, they couldn't produce enough lawyers in this country to keep all the court cases active. So it's not a concern to me. The other thing I wanted to ask about 3043 is when you solved circuits for getting the transfer functions, you typically used a shorthand method for just you shorted the inputs, you shorted the outputs. Yeah. What is that called? The shorthand that method it was taught to me by Professor Leach, who's the lead author of the lab manual. He understood how it worked. I don't understand how it works. I just do it. I mean, it's like, um, I always tell the students. If you don't like this technique, don't use it, you'll get the same answer, it'll just take you longer to get it. Now more towards your interest in digital design or like analog filter design and electric. I'm only involved in analog circuits. I mean, I know very little about digital circuits once you get past ones and zeros. Occasionally people get ideas for novels and stuff like that. And one of the things, if I had the skill to write a novel, is I would write a novel in which the entire population of the Earth was destroyed by an entire large gamma ray burst from a nearby star. And so you have the Earth sitting here with all the buildings in place, and uh, but no people. And then aliens from another star system come to Earth, and they come to the Atlanta, Georgia area. And an archaeologist spends his entire career trying to figure out the significance of the one and zero patterns on the Klaus Bridge, which are totally random, but he would spend his entire career looking at this pattern, trying to decode what message was contained in this collection of ones and zeros. Do you have any typical designs or engineers that you really like their work a lot and you would like other future electrical engineers to look at it, to go through it, to try to understand it? Uh, no, other than uh, I use Professor Leach as a uh, source for my classes. I mean, he has online videos and stuff like this, and he's the main author of the two textbooks for the course that I teach. And he also has lots of stuff on his webpage. He's also the creator of our audio engineering program, which is currently administered by Dr. Alan Robinson. And in fact, I'm, at the moment, I'm buying one of his amps off of eBay. One of my hobbies is collecting amps that were designed by him. And I have a huge collection of them. And uh, most of them work. And uh, I built one 30 or 40 years ago, and he was shocked to find out I could build something that worked. Over your career in electrical engineering, have you noticed any significant shifts in the technology or the devices that you've been building? The main difference in engineering education between now and when I started was when you would go into a lab back in the 1970s, you would find that a huge portion of the room was filled with data books on semiconductor devices. Nowadays, you don't find that because all that information is available on the web, the World Wide Web. We didn't have that back in the 1970s. If you wanted the pinouts, and the characteristics of the device, you had to get a data book from a company and look it up. Now that's all done online, or at the worst with DVDs and stuff like that. So the biggest change that's occurred in engineering education in my lifetime 
is with computing technology, when I started, we didn't even have calculators. We had slide rules. In fact, I have a slide rule here. It has my name scratched on it by my mother back in 1961. I told her not to do that because it would make me look like it some kind of nerd. I pull it out. It has a nice little leather case. People would put this around their belt. Your engineers walking around the campus, this will be slapping against their thigh. It was very impressive. You pull the thing out. You have two pieces of wood that move. And you can multiply numbers, take square roots, and all sorts of things. Most people wouldn't recognize this thing unless they're watching a movie made back in the 1930s or 40s in which someone is an engineer and he would always be holding one like this or looking like this. And the movie, I think it was the one with Tom Hanks on Apollo 12 or something like that, he was, uh, a lot of people were moving slide rules back and forth trying to figure out how to save them. And uh, I really don't think a slide rule would have been all that useful. But I keep my slide rule for nostalgic purposes. I like to say that it's a, a computational device which has infinite battery life, but reduced computing speed and accuracy. So uh, you'll find lots of slide rules on places like eBay. You won't find them with modern day engineering students. It would be like using an Abacus or something like that or a uh, sundial to, uh, instead of internet time. Could you tell us about some projects that your students have been working on and what they like doing? Well, what they like doing is getting out of whatever course I'm teaching. But uh, I, I enjoyed. I enjoyed. Uh, this is a T-shirt that I wore back when I was a graduate student teaching labs. It has the circuit diagram of a 741 on it. I can't put this shirt on anymore because I've gained a lot of weight since then but it has the insides of a 741 op amp. So I've told the 4043 students by the end of this semester, they'll know what each one of these transistors and the circuit's doing. The 3043 uh, students only know the non-inverting inverting inputs, the output and the power supply connections. But at the end of 4043, you'll understand what all of these things are doing inside the circuit. And um, Dr. Robinson just mentioned that you are really good at telling double E jokes. Could you share a few with us? No, you, you wouldn't like my jokes. I mean, uh, that uh, I can't think of an appropriate joke. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, that's that's fine. Um, also, um, what questions do you think high school students or college freshmen should be asking when they're trying to decide what they want to do in, your, in their careers? My only advice to high school students is do what you want to do. Don't do what someone else wants you to do. If your parents want you to go to college to study how to become a doctor and you don't want to be a doctor, then don't become a doctor. If you want to become a plumber and start making lots of money quick, go ahead and do that.